Welcome back to AZH Wound Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm your humble correspondent, Dr. Jeffrey Niesgoat, and I've got a very interesting case I'd like to share with you today. Uh, this young man walked into our clinic today uh, struggling with this ulcer for the past at least six months. It's been managed with a very variety of topicals. Uh, Santal has been the most recent topical, and obviously that has not worked. His evaluation is interesting. Uh, if you look, it is a plantar-based callus. And I write over the second and third metatarsals. His history is significant for a prior stroke. He had a CVA back in November. And so he's got some residual right-sided weakness, right upper extremity greater than the right lower extremity. Um, but the question is, if he's not ambulating, how would he develop this ulcer? Uh, he is a diabetic, and this is really a classic appearance for a diabetic foot ulcer, but as we all know, diabetic foot ulcers really uh, are related to the effect of neuropathy and patients typically walking on their feet. He's not doing much ambulation. So maybe this is some other type of ulcer. Maybe it's a pressure ulcer. Well, it's really not a pressure surface. Uh, he's not wearing um, uh, shoes that would cause this type of pressure. He's in a surgical shoe. So the question is, what's causing this? Well, again, in further questioning, he does use this extremity uh, to scoot along and propel his wheelchair, and I suspect that that caused some trauma on the forefoot, pushing down and causing trauma to this area, which caused the classic ulcer appearance. So an interesting uh, exam and history. Uh, it's very important to take a good history from your patients as that can help you figure out what is going on. But the reason I wanted to call your attention to this wound is if we look at it and we evaluate it, not only does he have the classic hyperkeratinosis of the callus uh, buildup around the ulcer margin, but this is all necrotic tissue. And this is nidus for infection. This is placing him at risk for uh, foot infection, limb infection, and uh, potentially for limb loss. And we're certainly trying to avoid that. So this needs to breed to breed it to evaluate the extent uh, of the uh, process as well as debulk and get rid of the necrotic tissue. Bacteria love this stuff. This is, uh, I guess you could say it's the Wheaties for bacteria. They love to feast on it and grow and so we're gonna get rid of it, take away their breakfast. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the tissue and we're gonna start dissecting. Often it's important to remind ourselves that uh, this tissue outside of the necrotic area is usually fairly well vascularized and so you want to be very careful we don't get into that viable tissue. It's hyperperfused, it's inflamed, and potentially uh, can bleed very readily. So we want to be uh, cautious with our debridement. So I like to remove the big necrotic plug first and then come back and do a little further cleanup. I'm dissecting between that plane of healthy and non-healthy tissue. As most of you know, I like using a curette for debridement, but this is really one that is not an ulcer for a curette debridement. You're really needing either scalpel or iris and scissors as I'm using here. We're starting to mobilize that necrotic plug. And there we go, we've just taken the breakfast and lunch for the bacteria and gotten rid of it to a great extent. So that goes into the wastebasket. As you can see, we did not debride the entire ulcer. There's still residual necrotic tissue. And I'm gonna come back and clean that up <clears throat> to the greatest extent possible. Many times these ulcers are best debrided in the operating room under a little bit more controlled environment. We don't have that luxury here today, so we're going to perform it in our center. Here's a good example. You see, I, this is still necrotic. I got just inside the necrotic tissue already starting to bleed. Again, which is good. We want to see the vascularization, but it reminds us that we need to be careful with this debridement. Now, why am I doing this? Well, I talked about debulking and getting rid of this necrotic debris. But I also want to get an idea of the extent of the tissue necrosis and whether there's any bony involvement, uh, how far the necrotic process spreads. So that's 
there's many reasons that we're doing this debridement. So we are right down to metatarsals. I can actually feel those metatarsals in the wound. The second doesn't extend over to the first, the second, the third. And if you look here, we do have necrotic tissue, but it's fairly limited. There's not a lot of undermining tunneling outside of that area. So we'll continue to clean this up, but I think that we can safely say that this doesn't extend into the plantar foot nor up between the toes very much. So it appears that this is an isolated, limited process. Obviously, we'll come back and clean up the callus. We've addressed his vascular system. We're going to be getting an MRI, MRA, and then uh, endovascular intervention tomorrow. So I hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Wound Care Window and this discussion of a very interesting presentation of an unusual diabetic foot ulcer. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us.